just when you're ready. Okay. Yeah, I'm ready. Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My special guest today is Chris Middleman. He's the CIO of Middleman Brothers, CIO founder. Absolutely fascinating uh, investment strategy, uh, long-term track, or track record of outperformance. We'll be talking to Chris right after this. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquirers Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquirers Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquires Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit AcquiresFunds.com. First time I, yeah. I heard about you uh, was the Carmike AMC, the 13D that you filed there, because I thought that was a really interesting. You guys used some unusual litigation tactic in that, from what I recall. Yeah, you know, we were just holding out for a better price because it was clearly, you know, undervalued. And I um, I don't think it was so unique. I think it was just about, you know, standing up for fairness when, um, you know, it was it was not being offered. It's unusual to have to, you know, tell the company uh, to hold out for a better price when the company itself, you know, should be doing that for you. But I think there was a lack of... Uh, well, first of all, there was not a lot of insider ownership uh, in right. Carmike. And so that's a risk you take sometimes when you're dealing with um, people that are acting you know, more as agents than as owners. Right. Uh, that, that agency risk can bite you sometimes. So I think what happened there was that you know, these guys not owning a lot of stock were receptive to you know, a number that didn't make sense to an owner. Um, and and uh, yeah, so that, w- that was a, a problem. So you know, I had tried to educate them. Um, on this and I tried to before this deal was even announced I tried to give them a sense of what we thought fair value was and this was over the course of many years because we had been owners for seven, eight, nine years I think and um, and it, they just didn't get it uh, so, so I think they really some, some people uh, are not very good at the appraisal process figuring out what things are worth um, and, and I guess these guys even though they, they ran the business well you know I I was never unhappy about the way that they were running the business, but when it came to valuing the business, um, they they didn't have a, a real facility there, and that happens a lot. A lot, you know, it's rare that you get a guy who's a great business manager in a certain field and also happens to understand, you know, valuation really well. I mean, it, you know, think about it; it's a very different thing. A guy who runs, you know, an amazing uh, business, not necessarily going to be attuned to you know these capital allocation type uh you know decisions so you know I, i'm not surprised it happens I, I was just surprised that that they did what they did because i had been so um communi- communicative about our views on it and, and to uh and to sell at a price that was so clearly below what your largest shareholder had been telling you for some time uh that that seemed you know wrong um and anyway i couldn't agree more it's a phenomenon i've seen many times with an entrepreneur engineer typically founder who gets to a point where it's it's quite a, a substantial business and then hasn't sort of thought through the capital allocation, buying back shares. You know, if if they get cheap, what they can, what levers they can pull at that stage. And I think it's that's often an opportunity for um, not necessarily an activist investor, just an engaged investor to sort of explain the various tools that they have at their disposal to correct that price. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Carmike was particularly interesting though because AMC was was cheaper than Carmike even at the bid price, and uh, and the 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 AMC uh, CEO had said that he wouldn't issue shares at that price, and somehow Carmike was quite happy to sell at that price. Yeah, I think um, you you have to remember also that that Carmike was they they also had inside of them um this thing with screen vision screen vision was the um you know before the movie uh advertising firm a- and if amc uh, acquired carmike they would have gotten a big uh boost from that stake in uh, in in screen vision there was a a mechanism by which you know if you converted theaters uh, over you got like extra shares i can't remember exactly what the form of remuneration was but it was valuable and it was a lot more valuable than than amc or carmike was talking about so we brought that up and and once you uh, once you adjusted for those things the valuation was actually much lower so so the headline valuation that they were talking about was a mirage 
and in reality, the, the actual kind of cash on cash valuation was like five times or something like that. Like five, it was like five and a half to six and a half times, something that was just too low for a change of control for a movie theater business of that scale uh, and market position. And, and uh, so, listen, we, we got a little bit more out of it. I mean, instead of thirty dollars, we got thirty, you know, four and a half, something like that. But unfortunately, it was a very pyrrhic victory because instead of getting you know 100% cash at 30 and, and reinvesting that somewhere else, the stock that we got in AMC went from 35 to four, and uh, where it is today. And so, uh, and we averaged down into that. So, what was a victory of sorts has turned into you know something a little bit different. And um, you know, I still think AMC will ultimately give us a good return. But it's just you know ironic that you know we were fighting for stock versus cash and stock was the worst thing that we could have gotten at that moment <laughs> so well, let's, so let's talk about what you wish for let's talk about yeah. middleman brothers a little bit you you've uh, you, you set that up uh it was 12 31 2002 so first operating year 2003 this is the fund i'm talking about that was did the firm pre-exist the fund oh i'm sorry yeah that's that number, uh, what you're referring to there is our composite performance, and that composite performance actually predates the existence of the firm. So the firm itself was founded in November or December of uh, 2005, and the reason that we have those three prior years of, of composite performance is that I had been working at other firms managing money for the various accounts that came with me to, the, you know, to begin and form Middleman Brothers. And so we got a professional opinion that those performance numbers were portable because I had full control and, you know, sole discretion over the accounts. So that's why we have portability of uh, results going back to, I guess, the very end of 2002. So you're right. My first year of performance was 2003. So just what's the strategy? What, talk us through your flavor of value. I see you've got a private equity type approach. You like free cash flows, growing free cash flows over time. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I don't think there's anything um, you know really uh, unusual or you know fancy about it. We're, we, you know, we look for the same kind of thing. I think that everyone looks for in this business, um, you know, a durable franchise, something where you can, you know, get some sense of certainty that the cash flows that are there now will be there in the future. Um, you know, I, I think when you look at the way that we've actually invested over the years, that kind of tells you the story. I mean, it's been a very uh, concentrated approach. Uh, so we, I've always believed in that. I think when I first started uh, as a stockbroker in 1990, I came up with this concept of a global concentrated uh, value approach literally in the first year of my career. I just kind of read everything that, that I could read and it seemed like concentration made sense versus diversification, especially for you know, a one-man show. And um, the global aspect of it came about more kind of accidentally just because I started working in a what was then Shearson Lehman Hutton's international sales division. So that was my first exposure, and there was all this international research around. So I kind of, you know, had an affinity, affinity for it just because I was exposed to it at a, at a young age in my career. Uh, and the value side of it was obvious. I mean, you know, value investors, it's the inoculation, that whole thing, you either takes or it doesn't. Um, and so, so, yeah, from the very first days, I still have portfolios that I typed out on a typewriter that were basically – you know, 20 stocks, you know, 15 to 20 stocks and, you know, same kind of concentrations we use today, same type of global diversification. So, you know, anywhere from 30 to 60 percent international. Right now, we've been at the very high end of our international concentration for the last four or five years, which has not been helpful uh, because international, you know, has not been the best place to be, uh, you know, versus the U.S. lately. Uh, that may be turning now. We'll see. Well, the, everything uh, that's not everything that's not yeah. SAS or or yeah. FAMG or FANMAG or Fat Man or however yeah. you want to say it has been exactly. uh, has been tough. If you value or small or international, it's been I know. it's been a we, bit of a we, write off. Yeah. yeah, we've been in the epicenter of you know where the flows are not. So I mean, we are small, <laughs> we are global uh, and value oriented. So it's basically the worst quadrant that you could occupy, uh, and it shows. I mean, obviously our performance in the last few years has not been good. Um, you know, it's frustrating, but I do think that at some point, you know, the pendulum will swing back, and I don't really think that it should be so much about, you know, hoping for, you know, a return, you know, of, of the popular indices to, you know, your stuff. I mean, we were actually outperforming. You know, value's been underperforming for the last 10, 12 years, but the first 
four or five years of that, we were actually outperforming and outperforming right. substantially. So I don't think that just because one ascribes to a certain discipline that you have to kind of resign yourself to suffering when the discipline suffers. I mean, yeah, it can be a, a headwind, uh, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, so there's some guys that I know of, you know, smaller value guys that are doing really well in a bad, you know, environment for small value. Uh, so, you know, it's not, it, it's a, a bit of a convenient excuse, I guess, when we're not doing well to be able to point to that and say, oh, well, you know, at least we have some excuse. But the reality is that it's not determinative, really. I mean, if, if you, you know, pick your your points well, uh, prices, timing, all that stuff, you can make money even in a bad environment. So I think that that's out there as well. But yeah, it, it's it's at least nice to be able to say that we had some kind of headwind, and that's you know maybe one of the reasons why we've not done well over the last few years. You had some spectacular returns uh, uh, from inception, and then you're still ahead, uh, even though the last few years have been tough. That's one thing that I've observed quite a few uh, more discretionary managers have that you know, not everybody's uh, pure, n Not every nobody's looking at price multiples and building portfolios on price multiples. Everybody's looking for some quality and some other aspects in there that the quants regard as being separate factors, but no value investor would really ever separate them out. You want a cashy balance sheet and cash rich, ca good cash flows and so on. So w w what what are you looking at what are you looking for specifically when you're looking at targets? You, what's the what's the uh, what sort of industries? What sort of businesses? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I don't start with any kind of a top-down approach. So I, I think that um, you know, I, I just, I'm looking for you know, I'm, I'm looking to buy a, a, a stream of free cash flow that I think will grow at, at a at a attractive price if I can if I can get it. And obviously, there are special situations sometimes at the margin of that that are attractive so sometimes you know we could buy a company that we think may not have any free cash flow for a year or two but it's so cheap relative to its assets that you know we'll take the risk that the free cash flow doesn't come back as quickly you know so so you know we'll make exemptions and carve outs i i, I try not to be overly dogmatic about it i want to be open minded because you know sometimes there are great opportunities that would not necessarily be uh, you know picture perfect representations of your usual you know mo and that's fine i mean you don't have to uh the beauty of this business is that you know every day is a chance to do something different and if you really believe in something uh and it happens to be a little bit off from what your um you know kind of long-term core has been that that's not the end of the world so yeah I, i'm not uh, you know i'm not embarrassed or ashamed to sometimes veer away from you know whatever one would consider to be you know pure value uh if uh, if I think it's worth doing, that said, that that's very rare, you know, for 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 us to do, and um, and so I do think that you know when you look at our our history, it has been these kind of um, you know obvious franchise companies where they've had a, a major market position in an industry for many years, uh, where the proof of concept is beyond you know any reasonable doubt, um, you know, and where there there's kind of been some kind of a negative trend that we think is you know either you know transitory or you know cyclical and uh, and will ultimately be resolved so we're, we're getting involved in companies that once were considered good that are now considered not so good uh, and paying low prices for that where we have a, a, a disparate point of view about you know how bad and how long they'll be bad how has the uh, the sort of last few periods, last few years of value under performance? What, what has that done to your strategy? Have you evolved at all through that period? What are you, or are you, you, you sort of feel like this is uh, something that will come back eventually if you just keep on doing the same thing? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I hope I'm not being, you know, obstinate in the face of a, you know, new reality or, you know, just being blind. But I, I think that, you know, cash is cash, and if you're buying companies that generate cash or will generate cash in the not too distant future you're you know ultimately set up to to make money I am I, um, I, I do think that these cycles can take many years to play out so you know it's not shocking to me that you know we've been in the wilderness returns wise for you know five six years now um, it's it's happened to others before I mean there have been other managers that I admire and respect that have been out of favor for five or six years. I remember when I 
first bought into um, American Real Estate Partners, which is now known as Icon Enterprises, IEP. Mm -hmm. it, was called, it was called American uh, Real Estate Partners. The symbol was ACP, but it's the exact same corporate entity. So I bought it in 1996 thinking that you know, I was kind of bottom fishing Carl Icahn because Carl Icahn had gone through a number of years of being you know, just very beat up. Uh, he lost all of his money in TWA twice, two consecutive <laughs> bankruptcies. He lost all of his money in Marvel entertainment which is before they became successful with all these movies he, he saw the potential but in 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 lost it all and so when i bought into that in in 1996 i paid nine dollars a share when there was 13 dollars of net cash and another ten dollars of income producing real estate uh and and i thought there's no way i'm not going to make money with this guy at some point i mean he's not lost his mind um six years go by and the stock hasn't gone anywhere it's gone up and down. <laughs> six years have gone by. So, so I had watched the stock for six years before buying it, thinking that I was really being patient and smart. Another six years go by, and I made no money. Uh, and the value guys that were in the stock before me, who kind of led me to it, had left. Tweety Brown was right. the big value investor. Right. Yeah, and so, uh, and so they sold in despair at like eight or nine. But then from 2002, six years after the initial buy, to 2007, it went from nine to 140. And, uh, and we sold, unfortunately, no higher than 88. So I think we had like a 56, 54, 56 average exit. So essentially what happened was that six years of pain and misery turned into 10 years of about a 20% cager uh, on that investment. And, and so, you know, sometimes it can take a long time. Is, is the, is the, but, you know, how do you know whether you're being just, you know, stubborn and, 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 and my, you know, you have to question yourself all the time. And, and I don't know a hundred percent for sure that I'm going to be right on all these names. I, I'm sure that I won't be. I'm sure that some will be, uh, I think we've looked at, uh, Evan in our office, uh, our, our, uh, develop business development marketing guy. He did a spreadsheet, um, a year or two ago and it was, and it turned out that we had like a hundred names in total that we've ever invested in, uh, during the 17 years of the composite. And of those hundred names, we booked profits on nearly two thirds of them. Uh, so, you know, that's not a bad hit ratio. Uh, it's it's probably pretty good. I don't know. You know, I don't think anyone. Well, I haven't seen anyone else do that exercise or publish something like that. And uh, but I would assume that it's pretty good. And so, if we're right two thirds of the time, over an extended period of time, then that should be good enough to make an above average return because you know obviously we're buying things that are cheaper than the market average um, so so I, I do think it comes back is what I'm saying I don't think I'm being um, you know uh, kind of Pollyanna ish and thinking that you know things will ultimately get better because so much money is piled into these passive strategies and you know the it, it's very reminiscent I mean you look much younger than me so I don't know if you would remember this but you know in 1999 2000 it was a very similar mentality in the indices and in the QQQs and, you know, the people that thought that all you needed to do was hold uh, Cisco and GE and, and Disney and uh, JDS Uniface. And, uh, you know, and, and these things would take you to the promised land because they had been relentlessly going up. And, and so it's hard to fight that mentality until it doesn't work anymore. But those things all went down like 90 percent, almost all of them over the next three years. And, um, and we were actually up in those three years. So, you know, the clients that became the foundation of Millen Brothers who were with me, I was getting very skeptical, unhappy communications from clients in 99, telling me that I was out of touch with reality, that, you know, the old school doesn't work anymore. And, you know, it's been years, because uh, it was years at that point. In 99, it had been four years or so of me telling them, stay away from these expensive internet stocks and them going straight up. And my stuff, you know, going up, but not nearly as much. So what happened over the next three years, 2000, 2001, 2002, the market goes through a three-year, you know, baton death march bear market <laughs> where it's down like 40 to 80 percent, depending on the index. And we were up, you know, 20 percent over those three years. And it wasn't just us. There was other value guys like David Dream and other, I mean, a lot of value guys made money in those three years. And I think that kind of set up the renaissance of value investing that lasted until, you know, the, uh, I guess whatever period started the, you know, the, the retrograde. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I do think it cycles and, uh, and the, the cycle will ultimately turn. It may be turning now because as much as I don't like to think about, you know, these things, you know, the U S dollar does seem to play a factor in 
the efficacy of value investing. And for some reason, when the dollar is going down, it seems like value investing does better, and especially global value investing like we're doing for obvious reasons. So, so maybe this kind of sharp downdraft in the dollar, I think it dropped 9% in the last month or two, maybe that is a kind of prelude to uh, you know, a, a shift towards value again. I'm obviously hopeful that it will be, but uh, you know, it may be. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. Uh, let's, let's talk about uh, Amia. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. What's the, uh, what's the story there? Sure. Well, Amia started out as just a, a normal kind of value investment from my perspective. Um, I, I became aware of Amia in, uh, in 2003. Well, I became aware of it. So, so you know how you're you know, a value investor. Uh, we watch other value investors. And so I had been watching uh, Onyx Corp, which is a publicly traded Canadian private equity firm that's run by a guy named uh, Jerry Schwartz. And, uh, and I was just impressed with him at a young age, uh, watching him in the early 90s do different deals. And, and I never invested in the stock, but I just watched it. And so by having that stock on my uh, quote machine, uh, when news hit in 2003 that they were going to acquire 30% of Aeroplan from Air Canada, uh, it really piqued my interest because that had never been done before. Uh, in, in history, no one had ever invested in a frequent flyer program of an airline as a separate entity. Uh, and I thought that was a genius idea because the frequent flyer programs were clearly these cash cows inside of airlines. And Jerry Swartz described it at the time as the, you know, the diamond of, or you know, the crown jewel of Air Canada. And I totally got that. And uh, before he could close on that deal, I think the deal was to be valued around 8, 8.3 times EBITDA, something like that, for that 30% stake. Air Canada succumbed to bankruptcy, and the deal got scuttled. So the deal didn't happen, but it was in my mind, and I watched it. A couple of years later, 2005, Air Canada is out of bankruptcy. Aeroplan comes public at like 15 times EBITDA. So they must have secretly been thankful they didn't do that deal with Jerry Schwartz. But obviously at that point, it was not ap appealing to me. But I still watched it, and I was on my radar screen. Then something happened uh, years later. I didn't realize it, but they changed the name of the company from Aeroplan to Amia. At that point, I lost track of it. Um, a guy, um, there's a guy named Matt Sweeney, who's a super smart value investor uh, who runs a place called uh, Laughing Water Capital. Matt Sweeney sends us his letters. Um, he wrote up a piece on a, on a company in Canada, which is also traded in the U.S. called Points.com, which trades loyalty points. And, uh, and it was an interesting value idea that actually worked out very well. We didn't buy it, but it went from, I think he was recommending it at 7 or 8. It went to like 15, something like that. But upon receiving his letter in 2016, I think it was, uh, I remembered about Aeroplan. It triggered my you know, memory, and I went looking for it. And I didn't find it. Then I found it as Amia. And so I put Amia on my screen. So I just want, I'm trying to build you the story of how this all came about. So I had Amy on my screen. A couple of years go by, or a year or so goes by. And in May of 2017, Air Canada announces that they're going to uh, not deal with Amy anymore on their loyalty. They're going to basically not extend the contract when it expires in 2020, whatever the year was that it was going to expire, they were going to break it. And the stock fell 60% in one day. So May 2017, Aeroplan uh, or Amia dropped 60%. Because of you know Matt Sweeney's letter triggering me, because I had it on the screen, I noticed it, and I knew that there was other value. There was value in that business beyond just Aeroplan. I knew they had the, the loyalty program in Mexico, uh, PLM. I knew they had a big loyalty program in the United Kingdom called Nectar. Um, I, I really knew that there was going to be value there beyond Aeroplan. So a couple of weeks after that happened, I started buying the stock goes down 40% more, which is typical for us. I start buying a stock, it's almost guaranteed it'll be down 40% in a few months, and that's, that happened. We got to about 10% of the stock in the fall of uh, 2017. In Canada, that's the limit for filing. So uh, they have a pretty high limit there. In the United States, as you know, it's 5%. Um, so I filed uh, that we were gonna be passive investors in AMIA, and that was my intent. But I did notice something strange happening in AMIA that I didn't like they seemed to be in a panic over this Air Canada thing. And they were selling things at prices that didn't make sense. So they had a royalty uh, on um, another loyalty program in Canada called uh, Air Miles. Air Miles is owned by a US listed company called Alliance Data Systems, ADS. Air Miles has about, I think, 10 million uh, members in it. And it's a very valuable uh, loyalty program. 
we had a Amy owned a one percent royalty on that program, which amounted to about eight and a half million dollars pure free cash flow a year. They sold it for like five or six times that number. <laughs> And these things in Canada, there are royalty trusts in Canada that trade at 15, 16 times in the open market. Uh, and I was flabbergasted and I was stunned. So I met with their then CEO and their then CFO in our office in New York City. They were gracious enough to stop by. Um, and I told them, look, you know, we're not going to sue over this because it's not a huge amount of your NAV, but this can never happen again. You know, this this is an atrocious deal. And I asked them, you know, can you tell me who advised you that this was okay to do? Uh, they wouldn't tell me the name of the investment bank. Ultimately, I found out later. It didn't really matter. The point is that I, I put them on notice. I said, look, I don't want to be in a situation here where I wake up and find out that you sold nectar for something like, you know, five, seven, six, seven times EBITDA. That's, that was the point of my message. A couple of months go by, February 1st, 2018, they sell nectar not for five, six, seven times EBITDA, which I feared, for a negative number. <laughs> they, they, they sold a $50 million a year free cash flow generator, the largest loyalty program in the United Kingdom, for a net cash transfer to the buyer, which was Sainsbury, uh, Nectar's largest uh, partner. And then I realized that this was beyond remediation, uh, that you know we were gonna have to get involved actively. I spent the next week, you know, corralling resources, lawyers, uh, everything. And, uh, you know, I fired off letters, private stuff at first, uh, met with them, ultimately got a couple of uh, board seats, my brother Phil being the most critical one. By putting Phil on that board of directors, we were able to essentially stop them from hurting themselves uh, much more than they were going to do. So so we intervened, uh, we stopped them from, the fire sale that was in process, we stopped, thankfully, uh, before it got much, much worse. And we were able to salvage, you know, probably, you know, a few hundred million dollars that would have been gone had we not showed up when we did. So this was a very unusual amount of activism for us to be involved in. It's not what we desire to do or aspire to do. You know, we're not we're not one of those firms that wants to get involved in the, uh, you know, in, in the in the nitty gritty of running a company to that degree. That being said, once we were inside, we realized there's a lot of opportunity here because because of the, the prior mistakes and the tax losses that, that were generated, you know, we were, this thing was turning into ultimately almost the perfect permanent capital vehicle. And to have, you know, $700 million of tax loss assets and a huge pile of cash and, uh, you know, some decent businesses already under the umbrella, uh, especially this thing in Mexico, this loyalty program, uh, Premier Loyalty, it looked like an amazing setup. So it, it looked like, you know, an Icon Enterprises or American Real Estate Partners, but better. Uh, it, it looked like, you know, all these different holding companies that I had invested in, in the past, but better. Uh, and so, you know, being a big shareholder in it, being uh, so closely involved with it, you know, we thought we should try to, you know, help them direct those funds wisely. They didn't want that. They wanted to stay in loyalty. And that, that brought into a whole new fight. Ultimately, the, the litigation was resolved. The board was changed in its entirety, except for my brother, Phil. And now we've got a board of real owner operator types uh, the the board of directors owns 25 percent of the stock amongst themselves obviously middleman brothers being a big chunk of that you know 15 uh, percent or so uh, but it's it's a highly engaged experienced board investors uh, business operators uh, corporate governance experts um, it, it's a great board of directors and uh, and they're doing smart things they're buying back stock uh, they're making wise investments we you know I think that EMEA is in a, a point of transformation that the market has yet to fully um, recognize. I think that it's in the process of happening. They just got pick, uh, coverage was just picked up by Jefferies. Uh, Jefferies is a you know fairly sizable investment bank, but it's the first U.S. investment bank broker to pick up coverage of the company. And they came out with a, I think a nine and a half dollar target price on the uh, on the stock, which is still in the you know low uh, three dollar range Canadian. Um, I, I would like to see them move to a dual listing on the NYSC. Uh, we propose that, and I think they're considering it. Uh, when I say them, I mean I, I guess I should say us because I'm on the board now. Uh, but you know, I think that's something that that could reasonably uh, you know help the liquidity in the shares and also the visibility and and the valuation because it does seem like small caps in Toronto trade at a you know a very sizable discount to 
similarly sized small caps on the NYSE, you know, maybe even a 20% or so differential. And, uh, and so given that the investor base in AMIA has transferred so much to U.S. based value investors uh, who have, you know, kind of followed our lead, I guess, into the company, um, I think that it would be great to have a New York Stock Exchange listing for them to traffic in the shares. And maybe that would entice some others to join in. So it's a really good group of shareholders that are kind of uh, coalescing around this name. Uh, if you, you would know, I mean, you know, you're, you, you know, like almost everybody in the value business. So if you were to look through the shareholder roster, you would see a lot of names that you recognize and, and really high quality guys like uh, uh, David Marcus of Evermore uh, Global. Uh, you know, formerly of uh, Michael Price's uh, uh, mutual uh, shares. A, a lot of really smart guys have, you know, found this thing as appealing as we find it. And so so I do think there's a unique opportunity here. And it's incredibly exciting because, you know, we get to be, you know, involved. I mean, I've always been investing in these things as a passive investor. So, you know, when I bought the Icon thing, you know, I knew that Carl was going to do what he was going to do. And I was just going to, you know, be along for the ride. Some things I agreed with, some things I didn't agree with. But most of the things worked, and that's why ultimately it worked out. But, you know, I, I was involved in, with Lucadia before that. I was involved with um, a Harbinger Group, with, um, you know, a, a bunch of these kind of hold co types of investment vehicles um, that ultimately were, you know, dependent upon the investment acumen of basically one guy, uh, you know, one guy who is you know, the, the sole decision maker. Amy will be a little bit different because, you know, even though I'm the chief investment officer now, uh, it's an investment committee, so you know I, I can't just push a button and do what I want to do with Amia. Um, and I think a lot of investors are probably happy about that, given our trailing five-year <laughs> track record. I think that having some uh, controls on me probably makes the uh, investing public a little bit less nervous about Amia. Uh, but it's a really smart group on the investment committee. Um, guys uh, like Mike Lehman, who used to work at uh, Third Avenue Value under Marty Whitman for many years, and Gabelli before that. So it's... Um, it's a really good group, and uh, I, I think that it, it's heading in the right direction. Uh, I'm really excited about the investment they made in Clear Media. Clear Media had been a Midland Brothers holding for many years. We had owned it for, I think, seven and a half years, made about a 16% cager. The company was basically in a buyout situation that we would ultimately not be able to participate in just as, as regular shareholders because they wanted to buy the whole thing, and if we didn't acquiesce, then we would have had to fight you know, a, a appraisal rights <laughs> And that would not work in Hong Kong, probably. So, you know, Clear Media is an amazing business. It's the one of the largest outdoor advertising firms in China. Uh, the buyout group is is led by the CEO himself, by uh, Jack Ma's and Financial, uh, by um, J.C. Cadeau, one of the largest outdoor advertising, the largest in the world, and uh, and a Chinese um, a private equity fund uh, that that's basically owned by the state. So it's it's a it's a super blue chip group of uh, investors and. Now that AMIA has has bought that stake and and owns uh, another, st basically AMIA was able to acquire uh, 11 percent, nearly 11 percent stake in the company, just over the 10 percent necessary to block a, a forced merger, uh, and and so that 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 stake will survive, and, and our clients, Middleton Brothers clients who own a big position in AMIA, will benefit from that, uh, and AMIA will benefit from that. So I, I think that was an incredibly well timed uh, investment on their part because the uh, business itself seems to be rebounding in China. It's, um, uh, I think there was a bottom maybe a couple months ago and, and it's been turning up pretty sharply there in terms of the outdoor ad spend. Uh, so it, it, we'll see, I, I would imagine that by the time the uh, Beijing Winter Olympics come around in 2022, uh, that this business will be uh, doing very well and, uh, and, and we'll be very happy to have Amy as an owner. So what's the structure of Amia now? Your brother is the CEO, your CIO. Middleman Brothers, the entity, is now a wholly owned sub. Is that the way it works? Yeah, and Middleman Brothers will just be Middleman Brothers. It's not going to be, um, you know, th there are different models here. Um, Middleman Brothers itself will just continue to manage the money that Middleman Brothers manages. It's not going to be the manager of Amia's money. Uh, Obviously, Amia could send us some money to manage. I would be happy to, you know, receive uh, an account from them. But that's not the way it always works in these situations. For example, uh, Fairfax Financial, which is controlled by Prem Watsa, in 1992, Prem's money management firm, Hamplin Watsa, had been for years managing all of the float of that uh, company. And in 1992, to resolve the conflicts of being managed by an outsider who's actually the controlling shareholder of the firm, they bought 
Hamblin Watsa bought it inside of Fairfax, and they continue to manage all of Fairfax money. Uh, that that's you know not the goal here with Middleman Brothers. Middleman Brothers would you know continue to manage its clients' money, uh, but Amia will manage its own money, and obviously I will advise Amia you know as to you know how to go about doing that. So it'll be a little bit of a different um, dynamic there, and, and definitely a, a separation between the two entities, which is good because I think the clients of Middleman Brothers don't want to see a change coming in terms of you know my being able to operate the way that I have, and uh, and shareholders of Amia probably don't want to see somebody given carte blanche to do whatever he wants there. And so you view it as a permanent capital vehicle, something like an Icon, Icon Equity Partners, Berkshire, Fairfax, uh, that yeah, style I think, of... I think so, because it's set, up, it's set up that way. When you think about it, it's got a, you know, nearly $200 million of net cash, no debt. Uh, the only liability is this uh, perpetual preferred stock, which is you know somewhere, I think the blended interest rate on the uh, two different tranches is like... 5.4 percent um and because it's perpetual you know it doesn't really you know it, it's almost equity in a, in a truest sense of the word it really is equity because we don't have to buy it back and it's equity at a very low cost of equity so when you think about you know what equity financing normally you know requires it's definitely not 5.4 percent um so it and, and the tax loss assets so you've got you know, when I when I when I bought with into Icon's thing, there were no tax assets. There there was cash and income, but no tax assets. Um, Danielson Holdings is probably a good example. Danielson Holdings was a Marty Whitman Sam Zell uh, joint venture. There was a, a burnt out old insurance company that I bought in the late 90s, and it had like a billion dollars of NOLs uh, and some cash. And, and they turned that into Covanta, which is now a CVA, I think, on the New York Stock Exchange, a waste energy uh, company. The point is that. Having the tax assets and the cash uh, makes a big difference. And so when you look at what's going on in the world today with SPACs, everybody's doing SPACs. They love SPACs. People pay 100% in the dollar for the genius of the guy who's going to pull the trigger. With Amia, maybe you don't have a genius <laughs> at the at the helm, but you know somebody who's a little bit smarter than average, and and you're getting it at like you know less than half of what its uh, NAV is. And and so and and it's better than just that because we get the tax assets too. So when AMIA goes about looking for acquisitions and, and AMIA is, you know, ultimately going to buy something that generates enough cash flow to the whole co that we can, you know, sustain it that way, uh, we'll be in a better position because taxable income that we might purchase will be non-taxable to us for a number of years. And so that, that can make, you know, us paying seven or eight times EBITDA, uh, a lot better, uh, economically than it would be for someone else. And, and so I think it gives us a competitive advantage and, uh, and so that that's part of the reasons it's, it's so exciting um, is that that you know we've got a lot of flexibility and the structure is perfect for this and uh, you know obviously we're competing with a lot, with a lot of SPACs that are of similar size if not bigger but uh, I think that we're competing with a, with a bit of an advantage actually. Uh, just one of the things that I noticed in your in your note uh, that you that the the most recent one you talked about Buffett when he bought. Uh, control, when he got control of Berkshire, I didn't realize this. The f from sixty nine to seventy five, Berkshire share price almost halved over that per period of time. Do you want to do you want to tell that story? Sure. Well, that was something. I don't know where I first read about that, but I was surprised too, and I delved into it more deeply over the years, just because it's a period in, in Buffett's, you know, coming up that doesn't get a lot of attention because it's not you know super you know, amazing. It's like, oh, well, his stock went from, you know, 42 to 38 after hitting as high as 93. Kind of That's predates not, the letters too. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, um, and, and, I mean, the letters were actually going on, but they just weren't publicized. So there were letters and you can get them, but they're, they're not, you know, part of the, the more highly publicized, uh, you know, chunk of letters. And it was a more complicated, messy time, uh, you know, for Berkshire. He was actually, if, if you read, there's a book called The Snowball by, um, Alice, uh, Alice Schroeder, I think her name is, and, right. and she actually, I had known of her since my days at, at Payne Weber UBS because she was an insurance analyst, right. and she, I think, was one of the first ones to pick up coverage of Berkshire. It's amazing that Berkshire didn't have a sell-side research report on it until, I think, she picked it up in the late 90s wow. uh, after all the success that they had, which just goes, shows you, like, the way Wall Street works. But, um, so, so yeah, so I, I, I looked into this, and I was amazed to see that, you know, part of the reason that, that he was, you know, maybe having trouble getting a good valuation was that he was involved in some messy situations. Uh, Washington Post was going through a period where you know, they were under uh, U.S. government pressure. I think uh, Nixon was trying to cancel their broadcast license on uh, TV stations down in Florida. 
Um, he himself was under investigation by the SEC for insider trading or not insider trading. I think it was not insider. It was um, technically market manipulation or securities fraud because they had been bidding in the open market for a certain security at an unusually high price in a, in a, in a way to try to you know, help people who wanted to sell it. It was, it was actually, there was nothing nefarious about what he was doing. And it was actually done out of an abundance of goodness on his part. But because it technically tripped into what, what the SEC deemed to be securities uh, fraud or manipulation, you know, they had a very stressful period where they had to negotiate some kind of a settlement or a censure or something like that. It, it worked out that his reputation was saved. He didn't have to, you know, it didn't go to the next level, but you know it was a time that was that was uh, difficult, and I, I just thought it was interesting because think about yourself as an investor in that. You know, if you were there, six years is a long time uh, to wait. And, and and I thought what was really telling about it was that one of his best friends, that guy um, Harry Brand, who had been I think roommates with in New York City, so you know a friend of 15 years. You know, he tells Warren uh, Buffett, look, you know, I can't handle this thing going under 40. Tell me it won't go under 40. And Buffett's telling him, I can't tell you that. And so he sells it just above 40, half of his Berkshire stock, just because he couldn't take the psychological pain of having it been cut in half and going any further. Uh, and, and it's just, you know, you think about the magnitude of these decisions, you know, what that decision meant. Uh, and um, it's just it's just incredible. So, you know, who would have known that that, you know, from this kind of, you know, messy conglomerate that that such an amazing thing would develop. But that's, you know, that's the beauty of this business is that you could be wrong for a huge period of time and then be so right that that it makes it all worthwhile in the end. I think that's a kind of very encouraging message for value investors is that, you know, not to be, listen, you don't want to bury your head in the sand and just be, I mean, guys who, you know, held on to Sears, Kodak, you know, J.C. Penney, too long, obviously, you know, suffered. And, and so, you know, th there are times when it does become obvious that, that you need to move on. Um, but it's it's not always so obvious. And so um, I, I do think that period in history is something that, you know, people should study and look into more because it's really interesting to think of, you know, how hard it must have been for some people to stick with that investment, even though that was the exactly the right thing to do. Well, I think I think it's Harry Brandt who was uh, yep. the gentleman who did the scuttlebutt for yep. Buffett in uh, in his American Express position. So he's, he features very heavily in the Buffett uh, yeah, that's legend. Right. That was the name. That was the name. Yeah, was Even Harry Brandt couldn't hold on. It just shows yeah. how hard it is. I know. I know. It's incredible. It's incredible. I actually had a client. I won't name him, but uh, a client of mine who was uh, an investor in Berkshire in those years. And uh, and he had told me that he had had difficulty holding on to the shares because his bank, you know, wanted him to put up more equity uh, for a home mortgage or something like that. And his, you know, he, he was under a lot of pressure from his wife to sell some uh, and he didn't do it. Uh, and obviously, you know, everyone's very thankful for that now. So, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. There, there are a lot of stories like that in history. It, where... it wasn't it wasn't Buffett sort of sandbagging to kind of buy a little bit more over that period. No, no, because he, um, you know, he wasn't, um, he wasn't buying, I think, more Berkshire stock during those years. Um, he was buying more, um, during those years, he was buying companies, or buying pieces of companies in the open market, but he wasn't buying uh, Berkshire stock. Um, they also were buying uh, blue chip stamps. So when you think about that period, he was on the board, he, Charlie Munger, and uh, Rick Guerin on the West Coast, who had given them the idea they started buying blue chip stamps in late 69. And that's interesting because this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do AMIA is that I had had this kind of, you know, fantasy of having a blue chip stamps, you know, a loyalty program with a lot of float that I could invest right. the float. And I thought I'll never have that happen. It'll never happen to me. But I just thought, you know, someday maybe. And uh, and so blue chip stamps was one of a couple of these kind of programs. There was a s &H green stamps, which ended up with Lucadia. And, uh, and and that made them a ton of money. Uh, but blue chip stamps was a, a program that had a lot of float, uh, but it was dying. And I don't think Buffett or Munger or Garen realized how fast it was going to die. So from 1969, almost immediately they lost their biggest customer, which was like Safeway, uh, the gar the uh, grocery store chain. And so the stock got cut in half. They bought more. Uh, they built their stake from 10 percent to 20 percent, 30. Over time, they became a controlling shareholder. And over time, blue chip stamps did very well, despite the fact that their gross billings dropped like 80% during 10 years. Uh, and, and it was all basically just investing the float. So they took blue chip stamps float, they invested in companies like uh, Pinkerton's, the security guard service, they bought C's candy. Um, you know, they, they did a lot of things that ultimately 
compounded the uh, net worth of, of blue chip stamps by something like 15, 16 percent over the course of 10 years. Um, and that you know, was a very good thing for a business that was ostensibly dying. Uh, so that was, I think, I think that was kind of what was going on in the 70s there. And maybe that was a bit of a distraction for Berkshire shareholders who were thinking like, well, you know, is he with blue chips? Is, is he with us? You know, how does this work out? Ultimately, they merged the two things. So people don't remember this, but Munger himself was not actually part of the Berkshire family until they merged blue chip stamps into it. So when blue chip stamps, I think they had, had they got up to 60 percent of the stock by the late 70s, early 80s. And I think by 1982 or 83, they merged blue chip into Berkshire and in doing so got Munger. So Munger officially became part of uh, Berkshire in that merger because he had been, I think, chairman or vice chairman of a uh, Blue chip stamps. So it's interesting the history and uh, and yeah that that part of it doesn't get studied as much. But I think that's the most interesting part because so many you know critical decisions made there were ultimately life changing for people that uh, that stuck with it. Yeah, it's a fascinating it's a fascinating story, Chris. Uh, that's we're coming up on time. If if folks want to get in contact with you uh, or follow along with what you're doing, what's the best way to do that? Uh, sure, I think um, the. Um, the website has uh, our contact information. If you go to Middleman, uh, www.middlemanbrothers.com, uh, you know, there's various uh, ways of reaching either me or Evan Newman, our, our, uh, our, our business development guy. And, uh, yeah, we're, we're very responsive. There's like an info at middlemanbrothers.com uh, email address. And, you know, we, uh, we follow up with almost everyone who asks the question. So I'd be happy to uh, receive inquiries that way. That's great. Uh, Chris Middleman of Middleman Brothers, thank you very much. Thank you.